Forming an international alliance against China, the EU reportedly plans to approach the United States with exactly that proposal, but how will it affect investors? Here to discuss, international editor Kim Iskian. Kim, welcome back. We always love to see you. Thanks, Jessica. So, Kim, this is coming from a Financial Times report that Europe wants to renew its partnership with the United States, quote, if the democratic world is to assert its interests against authoritarian powers and closed economies that exploit the openness our own societies depend on. First of all, it doesn't seem much of a mystery, but who are they talking about there? Yeah, pretty clear they're talking about, uh, about our friends in China. So what do you think it will take for the transatlantic relationship to be restored? Because obviously much, has, much ink has been spilled over the way the EU-US relationship changed over the last four years. Well, a lot of glass has been broken by the United States over the past few four years with, with its alliances, with its allies. So I think that now it'll be up to the Biden White House to go back to the EU, to go back to its allies and say, you know what, that was an anomaly. We're going to go back to the way things were in terms of the United States kind of being sitting at the, at the head of the table, being the adult in the room uh, and working with alliances, working in a multilateral fashion. The America First approach worked in some very selective ways until it became the America Alone approach. And I think that if nothing else, the past four, four years have taught us that you can get a whole lot more done working with other people than you can just trying to do it by yourself. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that struck me about the um, European posture in terms of investment implications going forward is that they see a way to solve a lot of the issues that have been raised by the pandemic um, and by the global recession, uh, that they will be solved by technology. So I would put it to you, um, and this is something we talked about during the IMF conference, what are the implications for investors, particularly in technology, which of course is heavily weighted in our indices here? Well, I think, I mean, just to step back for a moment, I think what we're going to be seeing is kind of a, an evolving Cold War between the West and China. And the avenue is going to be more technology rather than, than military and ideological. And what that means is that there's going to be essentially an iron curtain of technology between the West and China. And we're already seeing that for Facebook and Google. You have JD and Baidu, and we're going to see a lot more of that. Now, I think the good thing for investors is that just because they're two systems doesn't mean that one's going to win and one, and that one is going to lose. They're both going to thrive in their respective uh, atmospheres and environments. And I think there's arguably a, a positive element because they're going to be competing against each other and each wants to kind of one up the other. I want to bring up the issue of taxes because the EU has been ahead of uh, the US on taxing and trying to tax big data, big tech. Uh, how does the tax picture get resolved or addressed in this concept of an alliance against China between the EU and the US? Well, I think that the tax, uh, the tax issue has been lingering for a while. I think it'll be a question of finding some middle ground. I think the EU does have, it does have a point uh, and, and it's sort of this max size truck loophole that tech companies are able to drive through. And that's, uh, that's just unsustainable, I think, over the long term, especially as we see um, online retailers taking a bigger and bigger chunk of, of, the, of the global retail market. So there's going to be have to, something's going to have to give. I'd be surprised if it wasn't uh, on the U.S. side, if there wasn't some give on taxes. And to be honest, a lot of those big tech companies, they could definitely afford to pay a little bit more in tax. Yeah. <laughs> That's quite an understatement, actually, Kim. I think you would agree. Um, one of the things that China has really been very careful and intentional about with respect to Europe is that they've had this Belt and Road and the Maritime Belt and Road, right, where they have tried to build a deeper trade and investment relationships with countries along this pathway, mirroring the ancient Belt and Road of, of hundreds of years ago. Um, and a lot of those countries are in the stands or in Eastern Europe. Um, many of those countries are newer members to the European Union, but how do you see them playing into this alliance? Do they have enough sway to really um, cause some, some kind of change, or are they just going to have to go along? Because, you know, in many cases, they really benefit more from the EU in terms of governance and in terms of the currency. When they're in the currency union, that's a big benefit to them as well. You know, I think a lot of them will be opportunistic. And if China comes around with a great deal, uh, or you know, subsidized technology that they can't get from elsewhere, they're going to have to look at it very closely. And they're also in a good position because then they can go back to the EU and say, hey, look, 
you know, we don't really want to do this, but this is what's China offering. What can you do? Over the long term, I think that any politician in, in the West, including Eastern Europe, would have to think very carefully about hitching its wagon to China entirely, just because geographically, when you look at it, it's, it doesn't really make sense. And also, how long has China really been doing this? How long has it been involved for what, the past decade at most? Whereas these countries, the Serbias, the smaller countries in Eastern Europe are going to have to live with their neighbors, well, obviously forever. Um, and who's really going to be there to, to help them out if push comes to shove? Well, China, maybe, maybe not. Um, I think that, that's going to be a difficult equation. And also you have the, the short-term political implications. If you have a politician who's looking at getting reelected next year and you have this big sugar daddy that comes and offers you a pile of money, uh, what are you going to say? So I think that'll, that'll be difficult. But I think like, like we were saying with Germany, there will be a lot of gray area for these countries to, to tread between. And it's been very rare uh, that, that you're either on this side or that side um, in terms of economics like this. Ideo ideologically, it's different. That was the, the former Soviet Union and or that was the Soviet Union in the US in the Cold War. But here it's, it's a different sort of thing. One of the things that's really rocked the markets before the pandemic was the trade war. And um, in the middle of that trade war sat the World Trade Organization, which normally would be in a position to mitigate and mediate those disputes, but was basically hobbled because no one, um, and particularly the United States, did not approve of a number of the judges that need to sit on the WTO. They're now got a director general all but installed, save the US vote, to confirm that individual. I believe it's the Nigerian finance minister. Um, I would think markets would be awfully pleased if we could have a stable WTO once again working as the intermediator for trade disputes and that there would no longer be this sort of bilateral construct that the Trump administration brought in. Uh, it would be a fantastic thing for the global trade environment and for to perhaps see a resumption of global trade. I think for markets that, that kind of that kind of issue is a little bit obscure and there's so few direct market implications of it. Um, it, it's, it would kind of be a long-term positive for the global economy, but for markets specifically, I don't know. I, to me, that's, it's not direct enough. No one's going to say, I'm going to buy shares because of, of a more cooperative White House when it comes to the WTO. But you do think there would be more stability in the trade environment, which, oh, which does help that stocks. Be, that's, that's fantastically good for, for stocks, for the global investment environment, for everybody. Yeah. All right, Kim Eskian, where do we find more of what you're writing about? Because I believe you're writing about this exact topic really soon. I'm not sure we might have beat the publication date, but I know you're writing about this and, and some other international issues. Where do we find your work? Yeah, I write at AmericanConsequences.com. That's where you find a lot of my stuff. All right, great. Thanks for joining us. Always good to see you. Thanks, Jessica. And if you'd like to see much more content like this, please find us at these social media channels. You can find us on LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Thanks for joining us. That's all for now. I'm Jessica Stone.